This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by PDF Pen and PDF Pen Pro by Smile, the essential PDF utility. Download free demos and find out more at smilesoftware.com. This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, your solution when you need a virtual server in the cloud. Use the code MACVOICES2019 to take $20 off your first purchase at linode.com slash macvoices. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, on one of our gift guide shows, uh, our guest today mentioned that he had a new podcast, something I didn't know about, and so I wanted to drag him back here and talk about it. So I have Charles Edge back to talk about his latest effort, um, which I'll let him tell you about it. Charles, welcome back. It's good to see you. Thanks, Chuck. Um, yeah, so if I'm going to talk about that podcast, um, so it's called The History of Computing, and it's on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, all the all the things. And um, it was kind of an accidental podcast. Uh, it's It's a personal hobby project, so I don't have advertisers. I've tried to limit episodes to... I would say about 10 to 15 minutes typically, although I did my first interview on it um, and I interviewed Adam Inkst of Tidbits to talk about kind of the history of publishing. Um, and that one went 25 minutes over. And to quote Adam, I can't say hello in 15 minutes. So <laughs> it's bound to happen. But, uh, but you know, I started the podcast um coming off the tail end of my last book and the first chapter of my last book is the history of Apple device management. And while I was writing it, I had planned for the chapter to be about 10 pages. And when it hit about 30 pages, I started pulling content out of it. And when it hit about 60, I decided that it needed to spin into a, a whole different project because it had gotten totally out of control. So, um, so it, it's now a podcast. <laughs> well, it, that's interesting because the, if I remember correctly, the, you did a gift pick uh, of the book Hackers by Steve Levy. Yeah. And I sort of thought maybe that had some kind of tie in here uh, as the, the impetus for the podcast, but it sounds like the podcast was the, was the impetus for that pick. Yeah, um, I did an episode on the Tech Model Railroad Club um, out of MIT. And I would say that the book was the impetus for the ep for that episode, but I'd already started it before I read that um, the second time. I, re I read that book a long time ago, like 15 or 20 years ago. Um, and I was like, I want to go to MIT when I grow up. And I was already in my 20s by then. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, they, it, it is interesting because you wouldn't think that a model railroad club would really have any 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 place in the history of computers. And quite to the contrary, it had a pretty large place in the history of computers. Yeah, um, a lot was happening at MIT in that 10, 15 year range. And I mean, arguably, a lot has always happened at MIT um, in that regard. But uh, I would say that kind of confluence of people who were gathering at that time, um, whether it's Deadly Buck, which the the that book didn't go into at all, I don't think, um, or uh, Marvin Minsky, um, Jack Dennis. I don't think the book really covered Dennis all that much either. But there was there was just so much happening, and those those guys that were the main characters of that book happened to be at that right place, right time, and um, had a, a profound impact on everything that happened after. So I, I remember playing some of their, some of their games, uh, <laughs> um, but when I was in college, so. Charles, I, well, I think that the idea of a, of a, uh, of a computing history podcast is both interesting and important. It seems like we we're moving so fast that we don't take time to look back. And if you start looking back and saying, Hey, I remember when, we use punch cards and we did this and we did that. A lot of people look at you like, you know, okay, you are, you know, that must've been in the time of the Pharaohs, you know, and you're really old. <laughs> I mean, and, in computer years. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I sometimes think that it, it is, it definitely helps to get a little perspective on where we, where we were and where we are now and how quickly in, in relative terms we've gotten there uh, because I, 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 I see, 
people that weren't invo- engaged or involved in technology for so long, and they not, not necessarily even older people, but just at some point it, it invaded their lives. And then it's like, well, gee, why can't it do this? Why can't it do that? And I look at it and say, do you realize what it used to be like? Right. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of machine learning at work and uh, I, I find that some of these things that we think are cutting edge artificial intelligence type stuff, like it really started in the 1960s. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'm working with specifically, there are PhD dissertations from, you know, 1963 from research sponsored by the NSA. Um, and I, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing for my day job that I, I'm so into the history of these things. Cause I'll, I'll be working on a project and then I'll be like, well, how did that happen? And I'll start researching the history and I'm like, Oh, now I'm getting super behind. Cause <laughs> I got totally sidetracked on like who wrote this and why, and how did, you know, what, what's the underlying research. Um, and sometimes you also find that, uh, I don't want to say you refute, but you, you think of a different perspective knowing the history. So um, I, I think once upon a time, I thought, oh, d- these disruptive technologies, um, as an example, replacing a um, human process, a paper process with, with technology, like thinking that was disruptive or innovative. Um, but at this point, it's like, no, there's all these different confluences of different technical um, smaller innovations that kind of build up to a larger one. And a lot of times it takes 20, 30 years for anybody to, to really key in on what's happened, you know? So. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting perspective on it. And I, I just, I really like the idea because I, I'm not a huge history buff, but you know, a lot of the history that you're talking about, many of us have lived through, or, you know, you know at, at depending on what age we're talking about now as to what was going on then. But but we have that perspective. And to not have that perspective, I think you you don't appreciate how far we've come. And probably everybody says that when they hit a certain age, you know, well, when in my day. And that's that's not the case here. It's just a case of, you know, appreciate where we've been, where we are now, where you want to get to, and just and, and how much is happening. Cause even, I mean, I feel like you could almost measure it in the last five or 10 years that we've just seen these huge leaps and bounds. And yet people still complain about, well, I, you know, I'm working with 20, you know, 2015 technology. And it's like, well, that's not the dark ages. That was just a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. A two year old laptop is just not going to work for me anymore. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, some of these, um, you know, in the last five, I mean, a couple of episodes actually cover things that are somewhat recent. uh, Because my daughter loves playing it every night. Minecraft was an episode recently, and that's less than 10 years old. So, you know, I I don't think that um, just because it's not old, old doesn't mean that it's not heavily impactful, I think, on on what we're doing today. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's hard trying to stay away from, well, you know, I'm just going to talk about mainframes for 10 episodes and, and cover this model, this model, this model. Um, so far, I've been bouncing back and forth between later SaaS apps, um, MySpace, a, a mainframe here and there, a programming language here and there. So it, it it gets a little bit technical sometimes, but for the most part, I try to stay a little higher level since it is history. And and I'm sure somebody's going to say, ha ha, MySpace, you know, and kind of laugh about it. <laughs> right. That was revolutionary at the time. You know, that, I mean, GeoCities was, you know, was a huge thing. Um, you know, Apple's online service, AOL, things that are absolutely, you know, dust in the wind now were very relevant and very important to the, to where we are and where we've gotten to. Yeah. Some of the smaller things that are important are some of my favorites, like, uh, like um, I mentioned Dudley Buck earlier, his work on the, on basically cryogenic based computing. <laughs> um, some, some of the things that are just kind of getting to that point where I don't want to say they're forgotten, but like the game creation or space wars, um, you know, if it wasn't first, uh, then I, I find that a lot of times it's forgotten. The first thing usually sucked and it was the second thing that really made it ready for uh for the tornado of kind of everybody 
downloading it or accessing it. Um, so the first one gets all the all the credit, but a lot of times it's that second iteration that really made it usable. You know. <laughs> Well, you said that you just talked to Adam Angst, and I know yeah. Adam and I have had this conversation. When he wrote the Internet Starter Kit, and I'm not going to even pretend to remember the year, <laughs> it was pretty much everything you needed to know about the Internet. And that quickly <laughs> went way, you know, way out of date. There's just no way to be an expert on all of it anymore or to even quantify all of it at any moment because it's changing so fast. Yeah. Um, and some things oddly aren't changing that fast. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's become an obsession trying to analyze these trends and that, you know, I, I do a lot of that in my day job anyways, but, um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of fun looking at all these, all these things and trying to put things in perspective, um, of like, the vacuum tube. And then it took 20 years um, from the time the light bulb and vacuum tube were, were kind of invented for us to think, to put a flip-flop circuit to make that an actual um, binary device, you know, and then another 20 or 30 years to build a computer out of that and put um, like binary algebra behind it so that we could solve math problems. Um, And then, at least 20 more years where really computers were just there for math, you know? So it's funny to think that um, like if, if the MIT whirlwind project hadn't have gone uh, live, then maybe we'd still just be using computers for math and maybe we'd all be happier. I don't know, but (laughs) you know, (laughs) except for the podcasters out there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you think about something like VisiCalc and, and, you know, and what an amazing thing that was and it changed the business world forever and it changed in such a such a rapid fire fashion and now you look at it and it's like gee isn't that kind of a quaint little spreadsheet yeah (laughs) (laughs) i had a uh i i was at thanksgiving dinner i was talking about upcoming episodes and one of the people there um knew the the creators of physicalc and i was like oh i'm gonna do an episode on spreadsheets and they're like really an episode on spreadsheets. <laughs> and I'm like, just think of how revolutionary that was. Like once upon a time you had to have all these, all these ledgers and you had to go through an update, like, Oh, you have to update page 81 and 90 and 32 every time you updated a calculation and do them all by hand. And there were entire rooms of people. And I find it interesting that, that we have a lot of conversations about like automation, displacing jobs, um, and, and different classes of workers that that happens to, but, you know, some of those first jobs that were displaced were, were bookkeepers from, you know, back in the seventies or sixties. So. Smile and text expander are sponsoring this edition of Mac voices. Do you want to do something quick and easy to improve your productivity? Want something that is bulletproof that will improve the quality of your work? Are you looking for a utility that can integrate with just about any program on your Mac to make it better? If so, you're looking for Text Expander from Smile. Text Expander works pretty much everywhere on the Mac, inside just about any program. Desktop publishing, email, web publishing, browsers, task management applications, chat applications, the list goes on and on. Because all of those require text entry, and Text Expander helps you enter text quickly and accurately. Have a word, phrase, paragraph, or page that you need inserted regularly? Text Expander does it with a few keystrokes. Have a word that you misspell frequently? Text Expander can help you fix that so that it never happens again. Want to standardize wording to customer inquiries across your entire team? Text Expander is the answer. With almost no learning curve and massive payback on the time invested, you should be using Text Expander. Visit TextExpander.com right now, download a free trial, and find out what so many of the productivity experts already know. Text Expander from Smile, the makers of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for being the longest-running sponsor of Mac Voices. You, you know, I was thinking about that today, too, uh, from a little different angle. Uh, as, as we record this, I believe it was published today, there was an article in Wired on Clifford Stoll. Um, the book, The Cuckoo's Egg, and how he, as a computer scientist, had tracked a KGB hacker. 
And this is years and years and years ago. And now that's all we seem to hear is, you know, hackers and, you know, security issues and everything. That was arguably one of the first times that I recognized or paid any attention to security um, was through that book. And it, it really is. I mean, is it a little dated at this point? Sure. But it's still a fascinating read. Yeah. Um, I, some of those, I, I find that these days we talk a lot about security and I would, I, I would say at least half of my job is security related and I've written a few books on security, but I think we talk so much about it because as computers became more ubiquitous and we started putting more and more personal information on them, then all of a sudden privacy was a thing. But if you go back to, to um, like when Richard Stallman, the last hacker, I guess, in the hacker's book um, was at MIT, like he didn't want passwords on computers. He thought that was horrible. Um, and, and back in the beginnings of DARPA, like everybody would just tap in each other's computers and do things, but we didn't have credit cards, A, and they didn't keep like checking account information on their computers for the most part, you know, um, or driver's license IDs or social security numbers. So it's not like, um, we've made the privacy thing more of a thing with internet banking and stuff. And, and so it is important. Um, but I, I do think that um, there's, there's personal security of that stuff. And then there's quote unquote privacy. And at this point I, I had this conversation with someone at work today. I, I don't think that there is any privacy left. It's, it's a fallacy, you know? So. <clears throat> I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And, you know, you're saying we didn't have credit cards and we didn't do online shopping and and all those things. So there was no reason to have have an algorithm follow you around the web and see what you were doing and gather up that information. Now, you know, that's that's actionable. It can be monetized. And, you know, so it, it, it just, it's an evolution that kind of makes sense if you look at how it happened. I'm not sure where you were, but that first big, Black Friday, uh, well, there was no Cyber Monday. It was a big Black Friday, and you know everybody's talking about, are you going to order anything on the internet? No, I'm not sure about this. I'm not sure if I, I think this is a good idea. And now the internet sales, you know, far outstrip the uh, the brick and mortar stores. So it 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 all is. It's important to see where you came from. And, and how you got here. And, and I keep saying that over and over because I can think of so many examples. Go back to AOL and eWorld and all those, CompuServe, um, the source. And the most po- some of the most popular parts of that were the, the message boards. And they were precursors to Twitter and Facebook and to a right. lesser degree, Instagram. And, yeah. you know, here we are. Everybody wants to be social. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's definitely true. Um, I, you know, I think one of the other things that I've been really focused on, um, and I tried to put this in the tagline as I introduce each each episode of the podcast, but, um, but the whole concept of knowing where you're going, um, and, and everything, not just technology is, is often derived from where you came from, you know? Um, and I, I definitely think that, uh, as we look at all these new things that come along, Oh, Uber has displaced, you know, the, the traditional taxi cab, uh, Airbnb is displacing hotels, things like that. It's like, well, we've kind of been through all of these innovations before it's most of this isn't new, you know, um, it, uh, and yet every day, I, I'm surprised when I see, oh, there's this new graph API or language, or there's this new, you know, thing. And a lot of times you're like, well, we're still three or five years out of that being useful. But at the same time, it's super cool. And we should be cognizant of it in case that uh, that time horizon kind of ends up coming faster than we thought. Yeah. And you mentioned before about the uh, the bookkeepers being put out of out of jobs, yeah. and and there was nobody screaming about that at that time. Now we see you know different things happening, and and there's suddenly this concern over the workers, and there's almost I get the times that there's a feeling of a pushback on the automation of things, that well we shouldn't automate it because people are losing their jobs, 
And if, I mean, if that had been the case back then, you know, we would not have made the progress we've made now. And I realized that I could get emails on this. And so folks, if you feel need to scream at me, that's fine. But, you know, it's, it, again, it's all part of the evolution and, and those people, they had to go and get retrained or, or, you know, and they certainly didn't all lose their jobs. They just had to make some shifts. I think we still have to do that too. I just wish I could go back. I wish I was smart enough to see the trends now that seem to be so obvious then and and where they've led us. And now what's going on now and where's it going to take us. And there are people that are a lot smarter than I am that can see that. I can't find it. I keep trying, but I can't find it. Yeah. I um, To touch on your first point, I think we need to be more and this, I, I'm not, I'm not political and by nature. So I, I would like to, preface the statement this way, but I think we need to be more responsible as a society. And as we displace entire industries, um, you know, just being cognizant of, of the human cost of doing that. Um, and there, there is a lot of, uh, whether it's culturally time to market, whether it's, um, whether it's just cost, straight up cost reduction or quality improvements or just streamlining operations or being able to provide more something to the masses. Um, there's a lot of good reasons to, to automate out a lot of these things. Um, when I look at some of the industries that haven't started to get slashed, but I think are going to soon, um, I think of real estate and legal, and now we're getting into much more white collar jobs. And I think we're going to get a lot more blowback at that point, um, but and medical for that matter. But I, you know, with some of the machine learning stuff that that we're doing these days, it's like, well, I can ascertain within a ninety nine point eight percent degree of success, um, you know, exactly what medical ailment you have, which is a twelve percent better degree of success than your local doctor might have, or something like that. And, you know, um, is that right? Is that not right? You know, there are definitely, definitely cultural things. And I, I feel like for the, for maybe the first, second and third waves of computing, um, you know, Asimov, Heinlein and, and a few others had kind of prepared us for what was coming. <laughs> I'm not sure, um, with, with these next few, uh, that we will be. And oddly enough, there's a lot that they thought that we would be doing by now that we're not. Um, like I don't have a robot assistant. I, I I have Alexa, but I don't have like an actual robot that brings me drinks on a tray and, you know, makes me the, the perfect cocktail every night. So why not? I know. Right. I got to <laughs> get on that. <laughs> Um, one episode I wanted you to to talk a little bit about is you talk about the dark web mm, um, yeah. on one of them. And I found that interesting because a lot of us, I think, and, and I'll include myself to, to a lesser degree maybe than a lot of people, were not completely aware of how big a thing it was um, until you know it became widely publicized that this is a bad place and you started you know, seeing it pop up everywhere. And so why did you decide to include that in, in a, a, his, a computing history podcast? I mean, the origins of Tor uh, as an example are, you know, very similar to a lot of other things that came around. Um, and I, I wrote that one right around the same time that I, that I did the Snowden episode. Um, but uh, and it's almost like the other side of the Snowden episode in a way. Um, but to me, uh, the fact that the Navy wrote what is basically now called the dark web, um, was, was kind of fascinating and why they did it. Um, that is, speaking of things that we remember happening. I remember that I, I lived in LA and San Diego is only a, you know, a few miles down the road <laughs> at the time. And, um, I remember the first time that I accessed the internets anonymously and maybe a couple months later, I went to DEF CON for the first time and I definitely piped all my traffic through Tor while I was at DEF CON so that no, no one on the local DEF CON network could see it, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I, I think some of those things are, are, are important, um, because sometimes the, the intent shapes, 
how we perceive things um, as opposed to the reality of what's become of it, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, because there are plenty of things that started out as, as one thing and evolved into another, and sometimes not even with the approval of their creators. It just kind of happened. People, I, I think William Gibson said that the, the, you know, the street finds its own uses for things. And I think that's so true in computing and especially the web. Um, you know, where it was intended sort of as one thing by Tim Berners-Lee. And it's turned out to be, I think, quite a bit different than maybe what he originally envisioned. At least it's grown beyond that. It's funny because I I, I haven't felt the need to do an episode on the web. I did want to go for, you know, (laughs) but some of these stories, it's like, well, everybody knows it. You know, I don't need to do an episode on Facebook. (laughs) Like everybody's seen the movie. What's the point? Um, so yeah, <laughs> I might find know, a point. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe in a few years it might make a little more sense, but even, even so, I mean, there's still a lot of people that have, have come to Facebook that, you know, probably aren't even aware of the movie. Oh yeah. I mean, this, especially the younger ones, my kids, you know, that, that, that age, um, where they couldn't imagine a time before having a, an iPad with Netflix on it. Um, so I, I have done about, what, 50 episodes so far, and I have a list of nearly 600 episodes to go. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I'm writing an episode, I end up picking up two or three more ideas for future episodes. So, Not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the more I learn, the more I know I know nothing. <laughs> Yeah, right there with you on that. Today's Mac Voices is supported by Linode. You can build it on Linode. What can you build on Linode? Pretty much anything you want from a server perspective. With fast native SSD storage, industry-leading processors, and a 1.4 gigabit network, your server is going to be really fast. So your resulting web presence is going to be really fast. With Linode's quick install options, you can get all kind of servers up and running with just a click or two. WordPress, Minecraft, OpenVPN, Arc, WireGuard, Drupal, and more are all at your command. So creating is easy. Even if you have dozens of Linodes installed, their easy-to-use dashboard makes managing simple. So management is easy. Linode has data centers all over the world, from Newark to London, Singapore to Toronto. Linode has you covered. So managing geography-related matters is easy. In those rare instances that a problem does arise, Linode has 24-7 customer support. So support is easy. You can configure backups when you need them, with three times replication. So keeping the data on your server safe is easy. Increasing and decreasing storage can be done with a click. So adjusting to your growing or shrinking needs is easy. In other words, using Linode for your virtual cloud server is easy. That's why you need to visit linode.com slash macvoices right now to find out what it can do for you and to get a $20 discount on your first purchase. That's linode, L-I-N-O-D-E dot com slash macvoices. If you've been wanting to check out a virtual server, now's your big chance. Go to linode.com slash macvoices and get started today. Thanks to Linode for their support of Mac Voices. To wrap up, I, one thing that you have included in in some of these episodes or in in the the episodes you've done, and I think it's pretty pretty important because it's a lot of folks, especially the young ones, their first entree into computers, and that's computer games. Mm. And you know that 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 has such an important part of computing history, and it was not it was one that I really didn't participate in as much as so many people did, but it it was important. It continues to be super important. Yeah, I, you know, I just wrote, I haven't recorded it yet, but I just wrote one that's going to be somewhat long on the history of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I I still play once a month because I'm a super nerd, I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, what I was really trying to do there was look at kind of the game mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons and how they influenced even non-fantasy games, but, you know, any old war game with hit points and percentage probabilities of hit. Um, did you know that the uh, Gary Gygax who created Dungeons and Dragons was in insurance before? <laughs> no, I did not. Yeah. He was an underwriter. Um, and if you think about it, like, you know, uh, 
he was obsessed with statistics and the game mechanics. Um, and if you think about it, there's there's definitely a correlation there, you know. <laughs> I, I have this much familiarity with Dungeons and Dragons, but yeah, all of a sudden, it, it, if you approached it as that, if you sort of that is the basis for creating a game with all the probabilities and everything, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. It's, uh, so, you know, um, I, I'm definitely looking for inspiration for my own projects. And so that's kind of where a lot of this is derived from. <laughs> Who who should listen to this, um, Charles? And and that's kind of a loaded question because you want everybody to listen to it. But who do you think will get the most out of it? The the people that are sort of the the midline, and you, it would benefit them to hear a little bit of the history. The the real geeks like us who you know will go back and and there's a bit of nostalgia maybe involved. Um, who who do you think this should be targeted to? I would say all of those and none of those. Um, I typically find that if I subscribe to a podcast um, and they're doing an episode that I'm interested in, I'll listen. And if they're doing an episode I'm not interested in, I'll just skip that one, you know? Um, So as an example, Minecraft, um, I found a lot of people my age to just not like that game. They don't, they don't get the point. Like, well, who am I killing in the game? And you're like, well, it's more of a co-op game. You're not killing anybody. There's no real enemy you're building. And, and that can be hard to, to understand. So people who aren't interested in Minecraft should skip that episode as opposed to, um, you know, people who, who can remember, as you mentioned, programming punch cards might say, oh, the IBM S360 episode, you know, I, I remember seeing one of those. Um, or I remember using one of those. As an example, my grandma used to code uh, punch cards for the IBM S360. So that's one that she might have been interested in, you know? Um, So it varies. Uh, I, I personally think that any history is good. I'll listen to anything that's historical personally, um, which may be one of the reasons I'm doing this in the first place. (laughs) But, um, but yeah, I I would say anyone interested in a given episode, you know, um, and I'm definitely finding that I'm getting a lot of listens, you know, from people who are searching for Pong as an example. I did an episode on Pong. Um, so they'll find it that way, you know. <laughs> Why would you search on Pong in today's world? I, I have a feeling they were searching for beer Pong and sorely disappointed when they found my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's just my assumption based on my own. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your own Googling. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I feel like this is a, a real gem of a podcast. This is one of those that shouldn't get lost in all the noise of the political podcasts and the, the knitting podcasts and everything else out there. This, this really documents an important part of our uh, of our society's history and not just U S society, but the world as a society. And, and I, I applaud you for it and, and oh, thank you for your efforts. The, the ones I've listened to, I've thoroughly enjoyed and I've just got to dig through a whole lot more because there's a lot of great stuff there. Oh, thank you, Chuck. That's awfully kind, especially coming from you. <laughs> well, I, no, I, I really mean it. I'm, I, I really mean it. I mean, you have a way of making this stuff approachable and okay. So you dip your toe into the technical stuff a little bit. I think that's good. I think it's good to stretch people and make them understand that this stuff just doesn't happen, you know, because they want it to in front of them on their screen. Yeah, I should do one on screens. Huh. Thanks. No, <laughs> there's 601 folks. <laughs> um, let's touch on this briefly. Um, but you also have an, a book coming out if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so I took, uh, so I've written a lot of books on administration. Uh, so device management, um, servers, stuff like that. And what I tried to do is take a book that I'd done on iOS administration and a book I'd done on Mac administration. So you have a thousand or a hundred thousand Macs that you need to manage and kind of merge them because I see those topics kind of coming together. 
um, the way that Apple wants you to manage these is, is very similar these days. So um, I was lucky that, uh, that Rich Troughton decided to join the project with me. Um, he's a, a long-term Mac administration guru uh, and a great human. And, uh, and we cranked out this 777-page tome <laughs> over the last eight or nine months. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I I probably should have left them as two separate books um, in retrospect, but you know. <laughs> well, I, I would I would love believe me I'd love to hear more about that. So bring him and come back, and we'll do another sh- episode, and we'll talk a little bit about some sure. of that how how that's evolved um, because the the two platforms seem to be coming together at least to some degree, and I know there are a lot of listeners out there that are interested in this whether they're managing just, you know, two or three Macs for their family or two or 3000 for their business, or as you said, you know, a whole lot more for some of the really big installations. So let's do yeah. it. <laughs> um, all right. I'll, I'll uh, message Rich and, and get it booked up. Great. Sounds good. Cool. So in the meantime, let's, let's see, when you're not writing the book, when you're not doing the podcast, where else can folks find you? So I have another podcast we record once a week. Um, it's the Mac Admins podcast. So it's on super nerdy administration stuff, scripting, um, mobile device management, uh, you know, managing devices in mass for the most part, a little on security. Um, and then I'm C Edge 318 on Twitter. And I'm on, my name's Cryptid on most other networks. So, and that's K R Y P T E D. And I guess my website would be cryptid.com. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> Sleeping's not a thing. Okay. <laughs> Very overrated. <laughs> I slept until I had a kid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that trains you not to sleep anymore. Yeah, she'll be 18 and you know, half a dozen years or something, I'll sleep then. It'll be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, we'll mark that on the calendar. That'll be our next interview is Charles goes to sleep. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like Rip Van Winkle for 40 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of catching up to do. Hey, Charles, thanks so much for the time and, and congratulations on yet another great project. This is very thanks. cool. And I'm, I'm just embarrassed. I didn't know about it sooner, but now I'm glad I didn't I, publicize I, it at all. I, I didn't even mean to mention it when we were recording i haven't told almost anyone i just you know every now and then i'll i'll have an episode i particularly love, uh, that i like that i'll tweet but other than that i don't you know it's my own little project i just do it whenever i can so <laughs> well folks then tell tell you you go check it out and tell your friends and let's oh. let's let's melt the server down <laughs> please do i yeah. i challenge accepted on my side <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sure i'm sure charles thanks again it's great to see you i really appreciate the time yeah it's <laughs> always a blast thank you again so much for for having me out we'll do it again yeah. folks i'm chuck joiner this is mac voices no kidding this is a really really interesting podcast even if you just skip around if you hit an episode that doesn't interest you fine that's what you should do with any podcast um but but keep on going because there's some really really interesting stuff here no matter what your perspective is you're still going to i think find it both entertaining and informative until the next time and as always thanks for watching visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with chuck on social media Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.